Okay, it's 1048, uh, and in a moment we'll continue. I want to mention to everybody on, on this uh, event that uh, when we finally do this in New York, uh, in between each briefing, uh, we have refreshments, bagels and uh, other New York delicacies uh, that uh, we are not available to us uh, virtually. But uh, the program owes you at least several bagels and locks and uh, other kinds of things uh, that we'll have when we get to New York. Uh, the, uh, the other thing that happens in between each briefing is people uh, congratulate the briefers and gather around them. And often there's lots of photo taking and things of that sort. So we miss all of that. And uh, I hope that we get it soon. Uh, but uh, in any case, we are doing a, you guys are doing a wonderful job. These briefings are fabulous. And uh, let's continue now uh, with uh, the fourth of our briefings uh, on the Agricultural Resilience Act, which is uh, being advised by Professor Matt Palmer. And Emily Becker is going to give that briefing. So we're ready to go. Emily. Good morning, everybody. My name is Emily Becker. I will be your briefer for the Agriculture Resilience Act Lincoln briefing. I want to thank my team members, whose names you can see on this slide, with a particular word of thanks for Gwen Machione and Louisa Malahides, and to our faculty advisor, Matt Palmer. Let's start with the problem at hand. From our fields to our livestock production to the supply chains that stock our grocery stores and restaurants, Wasteful and environmentally harmful practices are incredibly common in U.S. agriculture. Our bill seeks to address these practices and curtail the impact of ag on U.S. carbon emissions. We'll go into greater depth on these practices in a moment, but first let's look at an example of one of these problems out in the world. This is a map of a community in Sampson County, North Carolina. In the top right-hand corner, you'll see a Smithfield hog farm, an industrial hog farming operation. The surrounding area has eight households, all, low, all longtime residents, black and mostly low income. Life in this community has been disrupted by the introduction of large scale industrial hog farming. When Smithfield came to Sampson County, they promised clean agricultural practices, respect for the community and good jobs. Instead, the Sampson County farm generated a host of environmental issues, including air and water contamination, increased porcine disease transmission, unpleasant odors, and elevated rates of greenhouse gas emissions. When residents complained of these problems, they were dismissed, which led them to <laughs> excuse me, file suit against Smithfield in 2018. These plaintiffs aren't alone. The problems caused by the Sampson County Farm are common refrains in the communities surrounding large-scale livestock agriculture. And this is just one case study demonstrating the widespread impact of industrial agriculture on our environment and human health. Our bill, the Agricultural Resilience Act, is designed to address these problems and others like it by proposing a series of agricultural reforms and programs designed to encourage sustainable agricultural practices. This graphic demonstrates the relative greenhouse gas emissions associated with different aspects of agriculture. While our bill aims to address each sector, we've limited our analysis today to three significant categories. Animal agriculture and waste, which corresponds to the livestock and fisheries figure on this slide. Soil management, which falls under crop production and land use and food loss and waste, which it's important to note, cuts across each of these categories. We'll start each section with a brief overview of the problem at hand, provide some scientific background, and then move on to our next category. We'll now go into greater depth on a problem you already know a little about from our case study, animal agriculture and waste, which as you can see here, contributes 14% of global emissions from livestock operations. As we know from our discussion of North Carolina's hog farms, livestock agriculture impacts the environment in a lot of different ways. While our bill is primarily focused on reducing greenhouse gas emissions, it also addresses a number of other important environmental problems, all of which are interconnected. Contaminants from waste is the first one we've listed here. Industrial livestock generate a number of contaminants in their waste, including E. coli. Common waste disposal methods, like the anaerobic lagoon, which you can see in the bottom image on this slide, uh, to spread these contaminants while generating large quantities of harmful greenhouse gases. In addition, some livestock emit greenhouse gases simply through digestion, and we'll talk a bit about that process later on. 
In the example we looked at at the beginning of the, this presentation, waste products were spread throughout the community due to the use of waste storage lagoons. Lagoons are effectively huge trenches filled with waste that's exposed to the open air. And you can see one in the middle of this diagram in that brown box. Waste is stored in these trenches where it ferments and is eventually sprayed onto surrounding fields to be used as a fertilizer. Waste products are emitted into the surrounding environment at several points in this process. You can see in the graphic that there is emission to air taking place at several points, including in the center and right hand side of the graphic. You may recall North Carolina residents commented on foul odor and hog fecal matter spreading within their homes. This is likely due to these emissions to air. Contaminants also percolate into soil and water at several points in this process, again in the center and right hand side of the graphic. Lastly, and perhaps most significantly, waste lagoons support bacteria that release carbon dioxide and methane into the atmosphere. We know a little bit about the methane emissions generated by manure storage, but it's worth noting that cattle themselves also contribute to the greenhouse gas emissions directly through a process called enteric fermentation. This graphic walks you through the breakdown of feed in a cow's three stomachs. The short version of this idea is that cattle chew on feed and then begin to break that feed down to access hard to reach nutrients. As food passes through each stomach chamber, it gets more and more reduced, but the digestive processes in the cow's stomachs generate methane, which gets released when they belch. Now that you have an understanding of the byproducts of digestion and waste storage, let's talk a bit about the work that goes into growing the crops that feed these animals as well as humans. We're moving on to soil management. 52% of US land is used for agriculture and with that come a number of environmental issues. Before we begin, we need to establish a baseline understanding of the importance of our soil as a carbon sink. Carbon in organic matter enters the soil through a few different pathways and can be stored there if the soils are well managed. As you can see in this graphic, plants absorb CO2 during photosynthesis and use its carbon to store energy from the sun in organic compounds. Once they've made these compounds, plants leak carbon storing organic matter into the soil through their roots. This contributes to carbon stocks in the soil itself. You can observe this process in the bottom half of the diagram. The organic carbon released into soil by plants acts as an important structural component of the soil while reducing greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere. The same benefits are incurred when carbon enters the soil through the decomposition of organic matter. However, many common agricultural practices result in the depletion of these carbon stocks, which in turn weakens soil structure and makes it harder to grow crops we need, in addition to reducing important greenhouse gas storage capacity. Practices like tilling and continuous crop growth accelerate the rate of decline in soil carbon. Tilling is a broad term used to describe common land cultivation practices. Unfortunately, these practices can break apart soil structure and thereby expose organic matter to microbes that consume that organic matter. Continuous crop growth is the use of fields without a fallow period or crop alternation. I wanna note that a fallow period is effectively just a resting period for the field. These types of agricultural practices lead to the deterioration of soil structure, which in turn leads to a reduction of pore space for water and airflow. These changes to water and airflow can then reduce agricultural capacities and lead to an increase in atmospheric carbon. They are also associated with decreases in soil fertility. So to make up for that loss, farmers need to apply fertilizer to their fields, a process that is often energy intensive. Fertilizer may compensate for the loss of organic matter, but it will also add additional emissions to the agricultural process. If we want to build a more sustainable agricultural system, we also need to look at the consumption of the products we grow and the livestock we raise. 40% of US food is wasted or lost each year. You may notice I've drawn a distinction here between waste and loss. Food loss occurs during production, storage, processing, and distribution. This often happens when farmers grow more than they expect they'll sell or need to sell to account for potential losses caused by weather events or the presence of pests. It can also take place in a factory setting where some processed foods may only use a part of each ingredient to generate the final product. By contrast, food waste occurs during consumption, meaning in our homes and restaurants. This may be due to large portion sizes or our failure to use products before they go bad. 
we wanted to show this graphic to give you a sense of all the different opportunities for energy waste in our food system. At each level of the system, so farming, processing, uh, wholesale, retail, some food is discarded and left to decay in a landfill. Additionally, energy inputs are also wasted. Growing food and raising livestock is energy intensive, uses lots of water, and as we've discussed, generates substantial greenhouse gas emissions. Transportation of all these products burns fossil fuels, and if products are wasted or lost and make their way to a landfill, they'll then incur additional fossil fuel losses. Once in a landfill, food will decay anaerobically, which produces methane emissions. Essentially, if we fail to efficiently allocate and use the food we grow and livestock we raise, we are both wasting initial inputs and adding additional greenhouse gas emissions during the decay of those products. All of the problems we've discussed today are interconnected and we cannot adequately address one problem, whether that's carbon loss in our soils or greenhouse gas emissions from livestock, without examining others. Our bill, the Agricultural Resilience Act, takes an interconnected view of the problems that plague the US agricultural system and puts forth bold ideas that will make broad and systemic improvements to the way US agriculture functions. We'll be talking about these solutions later in the semester, but we'd like to preview some of the core elements of the bill. The Agriculture Resilience Act has set a goal of a 50% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture by 2030 and net zero emissions by 2040. This is an ambitious goal and we'll talk more about how the bill advances that goal later in the semester. The bill also increases federal investment in public food and agriculture research with a focus on sustainable practices. Lastly, the bill establishes an array of new programs on soil health, farmland preservation, pasture-based livestock, and on-farm renewable energy. I look forward to exploring these and other solutions with you later in the semester. Thank you for your time this morning. I am happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Emily. Very nice briefing. Very well done. Stephanie, do we have any questions? We do. Let's see. We have a question from Carson. Um, hi, Emily. Thanks for that presentation. Um, I wanted to ask about the case study that you opened with, the um, 2018 lawsuit against Smithfield. I've heard of some similar um, lawsuits against major agricultural corporations. So I was just wondering um, if that was an effective or impactful lawsuit and if you found these sort of grassroots legal approaches to be effective in general. Yeah, um, I was really hoping someone would ask about the lawsuit because there was lots of detail that we couldn't put into this presentation. Um, so this particular suit did not end well. Um, basically, uh, the plaintiffs received about $100,000 in compensatory uh, fees it, which is not what they were hoping for. The prior year, there had been four other lawsuits in North Carolina, I think all of which were against Smithfield or Smithfield subsidiaries. Uh, and one of them had a huge payout. It was like a $57 million payout. Um, so they can be successful, but uh, something that confused me as I read up on these was that a lot of these suits are built around um, what, at, at least in my view, is the least empirically provable piece of the problem, which is odor, um, as opposed to water contamination, disease spread, um, and other metrics that are available. So uh, that may account for why some of the suits have been more successful than others. Um, in terms of whether I feel this kind of grassroots activism is effective, I do think it is significant uh, that more and more people, <clears throat> in particular in North Carolina, where our case study is centered, are paying attention to these industrial farming operations and thinking critically about the impact these farms have on the community. But at the same time, uh, Smithfield, for example, is closely tied to a lot of local politicians in North Carolina, um, which may account for the lack of movement. So I think it's a mixed bag. All right, we have lots of questions. Um, Nick was asking, can pasture-based farms match the current scale of meat production or does the bill depend on lower demand? Um, that is a good question, and I think we'll be able to provide you with more metrics on that as we talk more about solutions, but the bill does not rely on lower demand. I can't speak to whether pasture-based systems will be able to match the current scale of production with any degree of specificity, but I can uh, consult with my team and get back to you. Great. Uh, next, we'll have Jessica talk. 
Hi, yes, um, great presentation, Emily, and good morning, everyone, and good evening for some. Um, Emily, you mentioned that organic matter decay was good for soils. Um, if that's the case, why is food loss on farms um, from de natural disasters or pests a problem? Yeah, um, I actually have the same question for our resident soil expert, uh, Abigail. If you have questions, incidentally, about soil management, I would highly encourage you to reach out to her. Um, but I think the way that I think about it is that the inputs that go into producing that crop vastly outweigh any benefits you might have from the crop decay from the crop decaying like um, within the fields. So the emissions generated by producing the crop um, are still being wasted because the gains from the decay just don't outweigh the cost. Okay, uh, I see we have a bunch of questions, but we'll take one more. Uh, so you'll get a fourth question and then we'll I will end the briefing. Uh, Stephanie, who's the who can do next the next one? Yep, Sarah raised her hand first, so we'll let her go. Hi, thank you so much. And Emily, congratulations. What a great presentation. Um, my question relates to a, a fact that you stated in your presentation, which is that 14% of emissions from animal production um, or that there's 14 emissions percent coming from animal production to greenhouse gases. Is that statistic just from the United States or is that a global uh, percentage? Yeah, that is a good question. I believe it is global, but I will have to go back and check my notes. Okay, well, thank you very much, Emily. Wonderful presentation. I'm glad we, we got so much interest from the group um, and uh, we'll, 